He can't tweet a tweet or show his face on Facebook, but Donald Trump can still file a lawsuit. Can he ever? Tonight, Trump versus social media. They helped put him into the White House, but turned on him when he didn't want to leave. And then, the end of Shakari Richardson's Olympic journey. For now, anyway. The gold medal favorite won't be going to Tokyo after testing positive for marijuana. Was this the right decision? An Olympian whose gold medal was stripped away after he tested positive for pot weighs in on the controversy. How do you get the medal back? Tonight on Banfield. Hello and welcome to Banfield. Seriously, no one expected Donald Trump to take his social media comeuppance in silence. And since he was filing long, uh, lawsuits long before he ever got addicted to tweeting or texting or trolling, well, today's event at his New Jersey golf club seemed only a matter of time. The 45th president heralded the filing of several federal class action lawsuits against Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, claiming that they had violated his and other conservatives First Amendment rights by kicking them off their platforms. I've got a blue ribbon panel in just a moment. People want us to take on. So many people have said to me, please, sir, do something about big tech. Sue them, sir, sue them. And they've been saying it to me for a long time, but there has never been a better time to do it. Well, it is definitely time to kick this one around. Floyd Abrams is the dean of the First Amendment lawyers in this country, going all the way back to the Pentagon Papers. His most recent book is The Soul of the First Amendment. Very apt this evening. David K. Johnston is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best selling author of, among other works, The Making of Donald Trump. And Dan Gaynor, oversees the business and culture departments of the Media Research Center. Gentlemen, thank you all three. These are three very smart voices on this topic. Okay, so Floyd, I'd like to begin with you. What are the chances that these class action suits might actually go somewhere? I would say zero. Uh, I mean, the core of these cases is, as, as you just said, actually, that uh, 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 President Trump's, former President Trump's First Amendment rights have been violated. Um, uh, nothing could be clearer in the law uh, than only the government can violate someone's First Amendment rights. Facebook isn't the government. Twitter isn't the government. They make a passing try in the complaint to say, well, they were talking to people in the Democratic Party and things like that. But it, it's really not close. It, it is a lawsuit that surely some lawyer should have told Mr. Trump uh, had no chance of success if he brought it for the purpose of trying to win the case. There may be other motives, political motives, raising money motives, not my table. What I'm saying is that as a First Amendment matter, this is just a non-starter. So Dan Gaynor, um, Floyd Abrams makes a very good point. In fact, he makes a point that many people are making today, and that is that it is only the government that can um, abridge those, those rights, you know, not businesses. Uh, so where is the merit, in your opinion, in Donald Trump's suits? Well, the first, of, first of all, was he was he unfairly censored? Absolutely, it's indisputable that uh, Facebook and Twitter, for example, inter, you know, both uh, intervened and censored content that ended up interfering in the election. They they went after the Hunter Biden story, violating their own rate, own guidelines, their own terms of service. That's indisputable. I'm not a lawyer, but of course I've lived through tons of so-called rights challenges in our courts that everybody said, oh, there's no right uh, gay marriage. Remember when people said, oh, that's you have no right to that. And then, of course, people made, made the, the claims, worked through courts, and eventually things changed. So the argument that, uh, you know, people have rights to be in the new public square, which is what the online world is, is a, is a pretty compelling one. We no longer 
it's no longer just about free speech. Every aspect of our lives is lived online. And certainly after COVID last year, where everybody was forced into their homes, working, going to school, uh, you know, interacting with their government, if, the, if a very small number of social media companies can close out your entire access online, then, then they are shutting off the new town square. And that's, uh, you know, that's basically, I think, they're the argument for Trump. Well, I think it makes sense to consider these social media platforms the new town square because there sure are a lot of town criers out there. But the key aspect there is town, town square, because the town owns the square and we all pay for it. And therefore, anybody who gets kicked out of the town square for speaking his mind, that would be, you know, abridging a First Amendment right. David K. Johnson, can I ask you if... If there are so many um, legal minds in this country who do not believe that there is a chance, um, like a snowball's chance in hell, uh, of, this, of these suits making any headway, why would uh, Donald Trump do this? Oh, this is another effort to cajole money out of them. Uh, Donald has been posing as a billionaire for years when he's not. And what he's doing here is raising more money from, as he calls the people he says he loves, the poorly educated. Uh, legally, as Dan, um, uh, as Floyd Abrams very ably pointed out, he doesn't have a case. He has no prospect of a case. And the companies that banned Trump did so because he incited violence and violated the terms of service, just as a restaurant can throw you out for no shirt, no shoes. These organizations, in their terms of service that you agree to when you sign up, can enforce their rules. So this is really about keeping his profile up and raising money. And by the way, Donald had a social media platform. It drew fewer viewers than Little DC Report. It was a failure. So he's now trying to avoid responsibility for his failure and blame somebody else and make money off it at the same time. I did notice that the link um, for the fundraising emails that went out didn't just go to Donald Trump. They actually linked to other Republicans as well. So this could end up helping, you know, raise money for not just Donald Trump, but, but other Republicans. So, Floyd, let me ask you this. I, you, well, somebody earlier a minute ago just alluded to, to the attorneys who bring the suits. Um, who would do that? Because as I understand the law, and I don't know half of, I don't even know a sliver of what you know, you can actually be in trouble for, for frivolous work. And some are saying that these lawyers could be exposed. Do you believe that? Uh, I'll say first that uh, I'm in New York City. We used to have a mayor named Rudy Giuliani, who's now been stripped of his law license, at least temporarily because of statements he's made on behalf of then President Trump or former President Trump. So lawyers do run a level of risk. Uh, courts are generally you know, pretty easy. They don't like to suspend lawyers. You really have to do bad things <coughs> excuse me, uh, to get suspended, uh, to lose your, your license uh, and the like. But uh, do I think that this is the sort of lawsuit which is so bad, so insupportable as a legal matter. And by the way, for very good reason, this is not a technical point. I mean, the First Amendment uh, is not just law, but it's, it's deeply uh, uh, kept, adhered to, uh, and obeyed uh, policy in this country for the years since it was adopted. Uh, and so, uh, the, the notion that any court is going to say, well, look, uh, Facebook is really important. Without Facebook, he can't be heard. Well, first, it's not true. But would it hurt him? Did it hurt him not to be on Facebook? Sure. But that doesn't mean so, that the government can stop him. Remember, he's the one asking for the government. He's going in front of a judge saying, enter a court order requiring Facebook to put me on. Now, that is a different sort of very dangerous sort of censorship because they're keeping a private business from making their decision about who to, who to include in their platform, who to let speak on their territory. I mean, we've 
We've come a long way in this country. We have not come to the point where Facebook is United States Facebook or New York Facebook, a government entity. It isn't. And so the case, for very good reason, will likely be thrown out rather quickly. So, Dan, the, the good follow up to that is those terms of service. We all fly through those things, right? We click them because we want to get whatever it is we're going after online. We click that box. Does anybody ever read the 50 screens? No, but you sign it. And so did Donald Trump. And so the terms of service should be something that we are all allowed to enforce in our private businesses. Don't you agree? Well, it'd be nice if they enforce them consistently. They don't. Uh, we've got state's attorneys general looking into big tech, how they abuse their terms of service because they don't enforce them in any consistent way. They're also written, uh, the, the policies of Facebook alone, their content policies are something like 17,000 words just on what we get to see, not what they, they have behind the scenes. And it, it's written in such, a, in such a broad brush way. They're, they're ridiculously unenforceable. You could, you could drive a whole tank battalion through and not hit any of the words. It's Although you know very, what, Dan? Starbucks has, the, Starbucks has the right to serve me a coffee that's good some days and not good the other days. They, they have the right as a private company. I mean, this is a conservative argument, right? Leave well, businesses I mean, to do their business and don't meddle in their business. And isn't this looking to meddle? In business. No, it, it's not a conservative argument to allow monopolistic businesses to control every aspect of American society. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, YouTube, these are, these are companies that are so enormously large. They're the most large and powerful companies in human history. So you know, we, we've used government, I mean, you know, the Trump argument, we've used government to rein in monopolies before. You know, we, the government went after the railroads and the railroads were too powerful. The railroads were pikers compared to the power of big tech. Facebook, just Facebook alone, has 2.9 billion users. That's more than the two most populous countries on earth. You know, then, then you look at you know, Google. Google's 92% of all search on the entire planet. And you just go down the line, YouTube, number one, number one video you know, platform, and just work your way through it. So we've actually used government historically when businesses get out of line because someone, even the president of the United States, and this is the argument Trump would make, even when he was president of the United States, these companies were more powerful than he was, and they shut him down. So, no, we, we, the conser it's not conservative to let companies do absolutely anything and step on the ordinary citizens. But it's not Well, legal you are either. making a, a case for, yeah, go, uh, you're uh, just going to go to break, yeah. but Floyd, I think you were going to no, jump no, in sure. there on whether it was antitrust no, or whether I, this I is for say, Senate. They're different. No, we have antitrust laws. We have laws which are designed to protect against monopolistic practices, one company ruling the world. Let them bring if they dare that lawsuit but they just tried and, to and facebook they it didn't work they, they, and they would lose it but 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 it is this lawsuit the one they brought today the one he touted today was supposedly rooted in the first amendment and that's just nonsense so when we come back after the break, I'm going to dig in a little bit more into this this public square. I think what Dan said is interesting. And this public square doesn't have to take account for some of the stuff that's, you know, published in the public square because it's protected by something called Section 230. That's fancy. But basically, it's something that some people are disputing. Should these big tech companies have protection by the Communications Decency Act or should it go away? Those questions next. We'll also take this battle to the state legislatures, to Congress, and ultimately to the ballot box. And it will be a very popular one at the ballot box. I will never stop fighting to defend constitutional rights and sacred liberties of the American people. I will never stop. Well, he said it then, and now he's putting his money where his mouth is because Donald Trump today decided to file several class action lawsuits against the big tech companies. And with that, let's get back to our big discussion right now with my guests, the 
preeminent First, First Amendment lawyer in the country, Floyd Abrams, as well as journalist and author David K. Johnston and conservative media watchdog Dan Gaynor. So, David, right before we went to break, I mentioned this, this little thing that unless you follow the news all the time, you might not know what it is. It's Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and it's been much ballyhooed by those who, you know, want that shield to be dropped for the big tech companies who don't have to take account for the things that are said on their platform. You can't sue them for it if it's awful stuff. They they can't be, you know, they can't defame people because of this this protection. And Donald Trump has felt like it's a thorn in his side. Um, he wants that, by the way, dropped. He wants that to be declared unconstitutional in this lawsuit. Uh, what are the odds of that happening, either in the either in the lawsuit or anywhere else? Well, as a practical matter, zero and none. As a policy, that's another matter. But, you know, Donald had the opportunity when the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate to uh, bring forth legislation that would have addressed these things. He didn't, just like he didn't bring forth an infrastructure bill or many other things. Uh, Section 230 for the audience says that when a company like uh, Google or Facebook has something posted from someone else's publication, they're not liable for it. The original publisher of that information is liable for it. That seems to me to generally encourage more robust debate. It's certainly something I teach my law students at Syracuse about. Um, and we, we, we need to have more robust debate. Now, I agree with Dan that we have a real problem with monopolies and not enforcing the laws on monopolies. Trump's Justice Department didn't act on it. And let me point out that when I wrote a best-selling trilogy championing competitive markets, capitalism, exposing monopolies, the conservatives in this country totally ignored what I had to say. Totally ignored it. So pardon me if I'm a little cynical and not believing that um, uh, Dan and people who view the world as he does are actually serious about this issue because I laid out for them what the problems were and what could be done about it, and they paid no attention whatsoever. Well, Dan, that's a, that's a really interesting point. How do you respond to that? I did respond to it. We never had companies this big or this powerful, quite frankly. Sure, you, know, you look at, you, at the time no, I wrote. No, no, yeah, really absolutely. No, no, sorry, you just flat out wrong. Uh, you, the no, it's not, these, Dan. You're wrong. Is, Google and Facebook. I, I think I'm talking right now. So, ten years so, ago. And they were nowhere near this powerful. I just, oh, I just, just said, oh, no, that's, that's just such a ridiculous yeah. argument. You, you, no, you're just, you're just you, trying to get out just, of not I'm not getting out of control. anything. They, they've grown so powerful. And what's more is they've also started censoring. See, this is what you, you don't want to get. get. That, you go back to about 2014 when they really started the censor. It started to be very obvious. Then into the 2016 election, the, these companies were floored by the fact that conservatives even existed online and had any power. And when Trump won the 2016 election, on uh, no small part because of his social media presence, then they ramped up the censorship. It's been getting worse ever since. You know, the, we were taught, you know, many, many of these companies including particularly Twitter, said this is the free speech part of the of the world online. So as long as they were benign companies, nobody really cared that they were powerful. Once they started inflicting their power on people, people noticed big time. So let me let me uh, pivot a little bit here to, to Floyd Abrams and just the the, the the president. I mean, there have been so many suits like this that have been thrown out or have failed. There's just a lot of, you know, examples up until now that have not proven successful in this particular arena. And then just last week, a federal judge actually blocked a law that sought to penalize tech companies that, you know, ban um, people running for office in the run up to elections. So, I mean, I just can't, Im I can't imagine where the lawyers are going to find something really meaty to chew on uh, in litigating this. They're not. I mean, I, I don't think you, you ought to expect that they will have anything meaty to say. That case that you just mentioned, Florida statute, uh, based on the same sort of complaints about social media and the like, uh, the same sort of words, censorship and the like, uh, thrown out. I mean, really no surprise. And, and that's why the same thing will happen here. But I, I, I want to be clear that it's, it's important that we recognize 
why social media ought to have the rights. I'm not talking about the level of power by the amount of subscribers or monopolization, any issue like that, but that, <clears throat> that they should have the right to make the decision about uh, what is said on their platforms. I mean, Facebook has a policy against racist speech. Now, some of that speech is constitutionally protected, meaning the government can't punish it. But every responsible publisher, and Facebook too, says, we don't want this. We don't want this on our, in our newspapers. We don't want it on television. We don't want it uh, on, on our platforms. Uh, and that's true with respect to a lot of speech. Um, so, I mean, it's not new for Facebook and its competitors to say we don't want this. We, we don't want, you know, Alex Jones, you know, who sort of mocked the idea that the over 30 kids were, were gunned down in Connecticut. We, we don't want him on. And it, it's important that the First Amendment gives them the right not to have Alex Jones if they don't want him on. And it's important to, to say that at a time, January 6th and thereafter, in which President Trump, having already, whether you use the word instigated or any other word like that, certainly encouraged what became the insurrection and was then taking the position that, that he really had been elected, that, that a responsible publisher as well as social media entity might say, you know, we, we just don't need that on our property. Go find something else. Find well, another way to, to communicate. The, I keep coming back to the Starbucks it. argument. It's, I have the right to drop F-bombs, uh, but if I do it in a Starbucks, <laughs> they have the right to kick me out because it's just, it doesn't work for their business model. And until, Actually, on that point, unless and until that changes. Real quickly, David, i got to wrap yeah, it up, but if, tell me. If, if any law student of mine had drafted these complaints, I would have called them up on the phone and read them the riot act. They're terribly drawn complaints. Uh, they're very bad lawyer. I will well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, Floyd Abrams, David uh, K. Johnson, and, and Dan Gaynor, I really appreciate all the uh, the wisdom and uh, and the fire that you brought tonight. Thank you, all three of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, a U.S. Olympian who was the favorite to win the gold medal for America um, benched because she tested positive for marijuana. A former Olympian who had his gold medal stripped away for the very same thing, but then given back is going to join me with his thoughts. Shakari Richardson, the 21-year-old phenom sprinter who was America's best bet for a gold medal at the Tokyo Olympics. She's been left off the team after a positive test for marijuana. That decision by the U.S. track and field governing body has people divided right down the middle. Some saying, you know what, she knew the rules and she broke them. Others saying, come on, marijuana shouldn't even be considered a performance enhancing drug. I am joined by someone who knows better than anyone what Shakari is going through tonight. Ross Rabagliati won the first ever snowboarding gold medal at any Olympics, and that was in 1998 in Nagano. But then he was stripped of that gold medal after he tested positive for a very small amount of marijuana. Fortunately for Ross, at the time, marijuana was not on the list of banned substances. And so he got his medal back. Ross, it's great to see you after all these years. And I can see your beautiful Canadian background. Thank you for being on the, the program. You're the first person I thought of today when I wanted to, to discuss the Shakari Richardson story. I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. Um, it's it's a travesty, really, what's uh, happened to uh, Shakari. Um, you know, she's a, a bright star in, in uh, you know, the world of track and field, which is probably one of the most, if not the most competitive sport uh, on earth, um, arguably. And, um, you know, a great, a great American citizen and role model. And it's too bad that um, cannabis activism has to be, you know, made at the expense of such an outstanding uh, individual. 
So, Ross, I want to ask you a little bit about your experience because I sort of was one of those folks who thought when you got your metal back and they realized, okay, it's not a banned substance, and loads of people were behind you saying, gosh, give the guy two. If he won a gold um, and, and he had, you know, some marijuana in his system, it's not performance enhancing. What happened to you when you got back? Well, you know, it was a, a mixed, uh, re, you know, reception, really. We had, uh, of course, a lot of fans and, and a lot of support, you know, coming from British Columbia. You know, it's a, a cannabis culture, you could you could argue here. So, um, but there was a lot of mixed emotions as well. And, you know, my family endured, um, you know, a couple of death threats and, um, you know, some of the, the more, um, you know, less exciting parts of it were, were definitely uh, present. So as I understood it, um, the, the endorsements were not there for a guy who comes back and wins the very first gold medal ever for the snowboarding sport. It should have been a windfall for you. You should have, there should have been a ticker tape parade. And instead, uh, it, it was the opposite. And, and as I you knew, you got to tell me this is true. I read somewhere you put the gold medal in a drawer and it's still in the drawer. It, that that's a true story. I it stayed uh, my medal. It stayed in the uh, the drawer where you keep the stuff in your kitchen that you don't know where else it should go. <laughs> it was probably in there for a good decade. Um, you know, there, there was uh, a period of time that went by after the Olympics. I would say ten to fifteen years where I kind of had to deal with a lot of emotions and um, you know a kind of depression and PTSD almost from going through something that was so uh, you know just winning the the gold that was it was a big enough um you know change for me but to have to be embarrassed and to embarrass my country and um you know the sport of snowboarding was a debut at, at the nagano olympics like you mentioned so you know there was a lot on my shoulders and and i really um you know bore the brunt of it but at the same time i i did know um the platform that was that was given to me and you know as a cannabis um supporter you know leading up to 98 you know i i knew it was going to take time but it was an opportunity that i had to take to uh get behind cannabis and support athletes and people in the world who use it so we're seeing all these pictures of you i remember watching this i was so happy for you i was so happy to see snowboarding um you know included in the winter olympics for the first time and then that maple leaf you know walking along with the gold medal um but you know, it's weird how life works out. You know, here you are in your 40s and you had to go through the tunnel of crap and all of a sudden now Canada allows recreational marijuana use and it's cause celebra and you could actually launch companies and actually harness that, that brand that was so tarnished before. It is actually valuable now for you. You've got Ross Gold and I think you've got another company as well. Um, you'll have to tell me the name of it. But that must be that must be sort of sweet justice after all these years. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's, it's a long time coming. And just to let you know, I'll be 50 next week. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's been a long road of, uh, for me to, to stay healthy and stay on top of my game. And cannabis has really helped me get there. But to see cannabis come to uh, a point in, in history in Canada where we're at a recreational level, supported by the federal government, um, you know, we never thought that we would see that in, in our lifetime, you know, the most entrenched activists, you know, for cannabis legalization, never, never expected to see this. So, you know, we really believe that my experience in 98 really started the conversation in Canada about, about whether or not cannabis should be, um, under prohibition. And, you know, I think it's no secret that prohibition started, you know, rooted in racism, uh, to control the freed black slaves in America, and it continues to bog down corporate interests and IOC. Well, I, I want to ask you this question uh, as before we go to break. Um, you know, everybody made those jokes about you should get two gold medals because, oh my gosh, if, if you can win a gold medal uh, after smoking weed, or in your case, it was you've always said it was secondhand smoke. But um, but I've also heard you say you do believe it is a performance hence enhancing drug because you could sleep better, uh, you could recover better, um, your stress levels were lower, and there is maybe a case to be made that, yeah, it actually does enhance performance. Do you believe that? Yeah, I absolutely do. And that, you know, performance enhancing isn't necessarily what the traditional sense of the word really means. Like, you know, water is performance enhancing. You will die without it. So you perform better when you're hydrated. Same with eating a banana. Is it performance enhancing? 
banana because it's good for you or a recreational banana because it's on a banana split. Like, I mean, give me a break. It grows out of the ground. It comes out of a tree. It's natural. It should be promoted um, as a positive for athletes, as an alternative to pharmaceuticals that are addictive and, and just mask injuries. Um, you, whether or not performance enhancing or not performance enhancing, um, it has no place on the list of banned substances. Uh, the list is designed to keep a level playing field, and that's it. It's not a social issue list or anything, you know, to do with corporate image list or anything like that. And, um, you know, the IOC really needs to take the opportunity to be a leader in humanity. And whether or not some countries have cannabis legalized is, is completely irrelevant. Um, it, it should be, and it should be more accepted and used right across the board, um, you know, around the world. Okay, well, don't go anywhere, Ross. I have so many more questions for you. And also, when we come back, we're going to be joined by another Olympian who literally just wrote the book on how to face life's hurdles. Lolo Jones is going to be with us. And then also, the Jerry Maguire of sports agents. Literally, the guy who the movie was made about is going to talk about what this means um, for Shakira's future. Welcome back to our coverage of Team USA's decision to leave gold medal favorite sprinter Shakari Richardson off the Olympic team because of her positive test for marijuana. We've been discussing it with former Olympian Ross Rebagliati, who won the gold medal in giant slalom snowboarding at the 1998 Nagano Olympics. He was stripped of his gold medal due to his own positive marijuana test before getting that medal back. I also now want to bring in another Olympian, Lolo Jones, who has competed for America both in the Summer and Winter Olympics. I think she's only one of 10 people who's ever done both Olympics, so woo! Uh, her book is entitled, and I love this, Over It, How to Face Life's Hurdles with Grit, Hustle and Grace, and it'll be in stores on July 20th. And also joining the conversation is Lee Steinberg, a famous, I think it's fair to say, one of the most famous sports agents and the chairman of Steinberg Sports. Uh, he has represented some of the most talented and famous athletes in the world of sports. And some believe uh, the Tom Cruise role in Jerry Maguire was actually all about Lee Steinberg. Uh, so welcome, Lolo and, and Lee. Thank you for joining the conversation. Lolo, I want to get your reaction from someone who has been on many Oli an Olympic field. Um, this must have really kind of uh, shocked you a little bit, and I'm not sure how you fell uh, on, the, on the debate. Um, it was definitely shocking, um, especially Shakira went to LSU. I'm an LSU alumni, so uh, it was really hard to see everything going on with her. Um, uh, it was shocking because one for two different reasons and i know there's a huge debate going on it's shocking because all the athletes we know the rules we know we're going to get drug tested at the olympic trials shakari is the top sprinter in usa it's not like she didn't know she wasn't going to get drug tested there it's it's a hundred percent pretty much guaranteed because if you make the team you know the top three athletes are going to get drug tested on the other side this is an outdated uh ruling like marijuana shouldn't be on the performance enhancing list it's just by no means going to help you win a hundred meter sprint race if anything it's going to hurt your reaction time so there's two sides of the the debate uh one the the rules should be changed and i think that they should carry will be the reason the rules will change next year but the problem is that is the rule this year and all the athletes knew that going into the olympic trials that you would be drug tested and to make the olympic team you would be drug tested especially for uh marijuana so lee jump in on this because you know she is look at her she's a she is a walking brand she's one of those athletes that i think someone like you would say oh man i could see you on a, a million different product labels i could see you endorsing everything you're just you know, she reminds me of flojo right we all looked at her her nails and her makeup and they they just they were just these incredible characters uh you know in in competition they were not bland now with that said, Lee, does she have a chance at um, at still having some, you know, marketing viability? Oh, I think so, because it really is a compelling story. This woman lost her mother, which is about as tragic a situation other than losing your children as you could imagine. So there are rules, and it's important to follow them. On the other hand, 
there's human judgment about those rules and when to waive them. I've marketed people like Brian Boitano when he came back from the Winter Olympics, Kerry Strug, and the Olympics is the premier marketing event internationally in this uh, uh, world. So high profile during it, they would tell her backstory. If, if she can get this wave and come back and compete, I think that uh, for a younger generation, there's no stigma there. Uh, and I mean, think about it. You, you, your mother died and now you, uh, you turn to dope. This is not a, and performance enhancing. I mean, if eating uh, Fritos and candy um, and watching cartoons is performance enhancing, I'm not sure uh, how that plays. Well, there is that that uh, artificial confidence boost that you know Ross has mentioned in in previous interviews that that there is that part of it too. It's uh, there is a debate to be had. Let me read something um, that I think is really fascinating. It's from the USATF, the United States um, Track and Field Association. It's not the statement that I expected because I thought it would be very harsh, and yet it's very sympathetic uh, to Shakari. Let me read it. While the USATF fully agrees that the merit of the World Anti-Doping Agency rules related to THC should be reevaluated. all USATF athletes are equally aware of and must adhere to the current anti-doping code. So while our heartfelt understanding lies with Shakari, we must also maintain fairness for all of the athletes who attempted to realize their dreams by securing a place on the U.S. Olympic track and field team. Lolo is a little surprised about that because I know that they had two discretionary picks, but they did not choose um, Shakari with those discretionary picks. And sh her 30-day suspension was going to end before the relay, and they just didn't even allow that. Is this the end of this debate, Lolo? Is this the last time we're going to hear about marijuana being an issue? Do you think this is going to be the tipping point? I think that the rule is absolutely going to get changed because of Shakari, and I think a lot of athletes will support, uh, applaud her for that. Um, I think the reason why she probably wasn't picked for the discretionary is because you have to understand that there's other members on that relay team. So let's say they win a gold medal in a four by one, and if she smokes weed or again or test positive, they could have that medal stripped away. So I don't know if that's maybe the reason why they didn't pick her. They didn't want to risk that with the other girls winning their medals. Um, there's probably so many things and factors that went into place. But all I know is that this was definitely the tipping point to change this rule. And it needs to happen. The rule's outdated. And for sure, we will have different stipulations for THC and marijuana moving forward next year. Okay, well, when we come back after the break, I want to continue this conversation. And um, specifically because even the President of the United States, Joe Biden, weighed in on it. He said rules are rules. Okay, yeah, but then he went on to say whether they should remain the rules is a different issue. Um, after the break, I'm going to get you all to weigh in on the world of sports when it comes to marijuana. Because for a lot of other athletes, this is a dying issue. Shikari Richardson may not even know about the night that Ross Rebegliati went on the Jay Leno show only to be ridiculed for having lost his gold medal um, for having tested positive for marijuana. He got that medal back and then endured a lot of ridicule. And you know what, Ross? Um, in 2012, the Olympics started to really respond to the marijuana uh, situation because they loosened a lot of the restrictions. They upped the level that you could have in your system quite a bit, and they lowered the bans from like two years to the 30 days. Do you think that that's the beginning of the end? Because here we are almost a decade later, and this happened to Shakari. Yeah, well, it's really pointing towards that, actually. I think that you know, when they added it to uh, the list after me, then just recently they, they it's a thousand percent higher than what it used to be. And I think that speaks to uh, the cultural acceptance that cannabis is now having um, in America and Canada and, and other parts of the world. Yeah. And, and Lee, the NHL, the NBA and, you know, the NFL have all really eased up. Um, why are the Olympics uh, so sort of hell bent on it? Is it the whole violating the spirit of the sport part of it? They still drug test in the NFL and they specifically test at the combine. We've always seen it 
not as a test of uh, moral character, but an IQ test if you know you're going to be uh, tested. So the difficult part of it legally is that the federal government still outlaws marijuana. I live in California. There are billboards directing you to stores where, where anyone can, can buy it. So the problem is you have a mixed bag of states in terms of where they are. Some are medical marijuana, some are decriminalized and all the rest. So you can't expect a league like the NFL to allow it. And then because I live in California and someone else lives in Texas. Uh, so it's difficult that way. But I think that these rules will eventually uh, leave. See, when you're talking about what her future will be, it's the Olympics itself that are the premier marketing event. Um, my daughter fell in love with Loma Jones because you got her backstory. And so without it, we won't know much about this uh, talented sprinter. It's they market from the standpoint of getting to know the personality. So when you combine great performance with that uh, boost in terms of celebrity, that's what yeah. leads you to marketability. So she'll have some hey. problems. Yeah, I fell in love with Lolo, too, as a lot of Americans did. Lolo, I'm, I'm short on a little time, but I do want you to answer to the whole marketability thing, because even Shakari said, hey, everyone's talking about track. This is a good thing. Do you agree? I think absolutely. I think her, her tweet was perfect after the news broke. You know, I am human. Um, I, I think that she's doing an amazing job. She's a uh, talented runner, but... I really like watching her post-race interviews the most. And I think that's what I think is we're going to miss out on a great performance from her at the Olympics. Yeah. But like everyone said, getting to know those backstories. Oh, I mean, I just really right. was hoping to see that more of that, more of her interviews. I was hoping to, I was hoping to see a big old gold medal for, uh, for, for the U S but maybe that'll still happen. Sorry about that, Ross. Hey, Lolo Jones and Ross Rebagliati and Lee Steinberg. Thank you guys. I'll just give a couple of plugs here. Lolo's got that awesome book coming out. Props on the title, girl. It's awesome. Over it, How to Face Life's Hurdles with Grit, Hustle, and Grace. Lee is, of course, uh, the chairman of Steinberg Sports and Ross Rebagliati has Ross Gold. Is that right, Ross? Ross Gold, I got it right. Ross is gold. Here it is. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. Thanks, team, all my guests, and thank you for watching, everyone.